that's from around the world. Absolutely, absolutely lovely people. Welcome to our first Forward Thinkers webinar series in the year 2023. And this is organized by the World Future Council. And speaking live from Leipzig, my name is Jeffrey Edusa Opoku, and I am a Youth Presenter Representative of the World Future Council. And I would be your moderator for today's section on implementing a right to a clean, healthy, and toxic free environment. Fellow audience, the signs have confirmed. Ju, Ju, and Ju, and myself inclusive, we experience the impending impacts of the environmental crisis. We see it with our naked eyes, we feel it each and every day. Environmental hazards have had, and they continue to have a devastating impact on the well being of present generations, and they pose a threat to the future of young people. Environmental hazards take 1.7 million lives of children each year. Many children are forced to leave their homes, families and friends, and they suffer from diseases and also miss out on education. In another narrative, consider heavy precipitation force, which increases the risk of severe flooding. You know, last year in 2022, when I was in Accra, the capital city of Ghana, I experienced what is called severe flooding. And I think people joining us from Ghana will testify to this. A flood is so severe that lots of kids could not go to school, as well as my two little sisters. They couldn't go to school for some days because their school was flooded. And as a result, they had to miss on their education. I remember this like yesterday. I saw homes, I saw properties being distracted, and people had to sleep somewhere else. And it was highly unimaginable, and it was super risky. Now, globally, children are surrounded with toxic chemicals, and their future is at stake. The impact of climate crisis all the environmental hazards is no joke. And we must stand up to protect the rights of children and young people for a clean environment to save lives. Fellow audience, with 161 votes and eight abstentions, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a historic resolution in July, 2022. And this is exactly six months ago, declaring access to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment has a universal human right. And what does this mean? This triggers environmental action. It calls upon states, it calls upon international organizations, it calls upon businesses and other stakeholders like you and myself to scale up efforts to ensure a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment for all. In this year, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child will publish its general comment on number 26 on the children's rights and environment with a spe special focus on climate change. 7,416 children from 103 countries share their views and ideas in global consultation that was designed with members of the general comments number 26 children's advisory team. Fellow audience, without an intact environment, there is a risk in the success of this implementation. Now, one may wonder, what is that one core advantage of this resolution or this agenda and why should I care? Please permit me to keep you in suspense because in today's intergenerational dialogue, we're gonna have this UN, in, we're gonna have a discussion about this UN initiative and the way forward to securing our planet. Now, in the next one and a half hours, we will be hearing from the chair of the management board of the World Future Council, Alexandra Wando. She will give us a short introduction into the work of the World Future Council and its unique policy prize, the Future Policy Award. We will then take a deeper look at the recognition of the right to a healthy environment as a universal right by the United Nations General Assembly. And we are fortunate and privileged to have the president of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly of the UN, executive director of GWL Voices, and also a counselor of the World Future Council, Maria Espinosa. And she will give us an overview of the US efforts to promote the recognition of the right and about the importance of establishing such a right at a UN level. Now, equally exciting activities of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is in the process of drafting the general comment on number 26, we will have Reina Ivanova, a climate and child rights advocate, and our very own youth represent, representative, and she will speak on the significance of this general comment and what her hopes are regarding the next steps. Thereafter, we will have an amazing panelist. And when I mean amazing, I mean it. Our distinguished panelists will address the nexus of peace, hazardous chemicals, and a right to a healthy environment. 
with a special focus on the children and young people and its implication for young people and generations to come. We will be looking forward to this intergenerational dialogue with Nishan Kunasikara, Council of the World Future Council. He's an international lawyer and an educationist. We will also have Bia Alberman, who is with me, a youth present representative of the World Future Council, and also a planetary health advocate. We will also have Alan Ware, Councillor of the World Future Council, in conjunction with Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Thank you all, distinguished speakers, for accepting our invitation and making time for us to speak to us today to share some nuggets of wisdom and provide us some insights within the environmental landscape. Now, for the record, this webinar is live streamed on Facebook, and we will wish to know what you think and what you feel. So please do not hesitate to join the conversation in the chat of the Zoom and on Facebook. And we will not want to know your thought. It's really going to be an interesting program ahead filled with hope and courage. So kindly sit tight and relax. And you can equally share insightful submissions from the section on social media and our social media handles will be made available in the chat box. Now to kickstart, we will begin with the chair of the management board of the World Future Council, Alexandra Wando, who will introduce to us the World Future Council and their work and their policy award. The floor is yours. Ms. Wando. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for this kind introduction. And let me start by saying that actually never before did our decisions and actions have such profound consequences. And we face a huge responsibility. In particular, we believe at the World Future Council that we need precise demands in the form of best policies, and they actually can ensure rights and responsibilities go together. And this is why the World Future Council was founded back in the year 20, 2007. And the council focuses on identifying and spreading effective policy solutions for current challenges humanity is facing. And we honor them with the annual Future Policy Award. The Future Policy Award is globally speaking unique. It is the only award which celebrates policies that create better living conditions for current and future generations at an international level. And we celebrate these awards in partnership with UN agencies and other international organizations. Every year we identify a topic on which policy progress is particularly urgent. And the awarded policies, they provide excellent starting points for a race to the top to secure a safer world for our children and for future generations. In 2021, we awarded the world's best policies with the Future Policy Award on Protection from Hazardous Chemicals. In partnership with UN agencies, we awarded them Protecting from Hazardous Chemicals, but we also celebrated specific policies protecting from highly hazardous pesticides, lead and paint, and environmentally persistent pharmaceutical pollutants. In 2023, the Future Policy Award will take a closer look at pollutions, at uh, working towards policies for a pollution-free world, regulating the use of hazardous chemicals and products with a focus on children and their environment. And the award ceremony will be held this year during the fifth session of the International Conference for Chemical Management at the UN in Bonn, Germany, 25th to 29th of September. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for the introduction of the World Future Council and the very, very important work they are doing to, 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 to protect us from all hazardous chemicals. We will now proceed to watch a short film about the different aspects of the right to a healthy environment. And this video is kindly provided to us by the United Nations Environment Program. Every year, pollution kills millions of people around the world. That's because we breathe in toxic air, we eat fish laden with mercury, and we drink from rivers clogged with plastics. These problems issues are so common, we've begun to accept them. But did you know that you have a right to a clean environment? Every day, people can use the law and their purchasing power to press governments and businesses to respect Mother Nature. Air. Everybody should have a right to clean air. 
But airborne pollution is one of the biggest health risks of our time. It kills more than 7 million people every year and is a driving force behind climate change. How can you combat air pollution? Ask your government to provide data on the air quality in your region. In many places, you have a right to that information. Call on your leaders to fulfill their obligations to regulate and in some cases ban pollutants, like those emitted from heavy industries. Claim your right for clean air. Clean air is our human right. Water. We all have a right to clean water, but every day, two billion tons of waste is dumped into our rivers, lakes, and oceans. That causes diseases that contribute to the deaths of millions of people every year. How can you fight water pollution? In many places, you've the right to access water quality data and to demand that your water is free from pollution. With clean water, our food will be better, our communities will be happier, and our children will be healthier, allowing them to spend more time in school and giving them a brighter future. Access to clean water is our human right. Land and soil. The land that supports our societies is under threat. Our soils and crops are being contaminated by pesticides, fertilizers, and industrial runoff in some cases making us sicker and shortening our lives. But did you know you have a right to live without pollution? In many countries, you must be consulted before farmland is developed. You can demand that governments ban the use of harmful pollutants and stop the exploitation of indigenous lands. And you can advocate for development that is environmentally sustainable. The protection of our land and soil is our human right. Marine. Billions of people around the world rely on our oceans for food and for their livelihoods. But eight million tons of plastic and toxic waste enter the sea each year, contaminating fish, clogging shorelines, and hampering shipping. By exercising your fundamental human rights, you can help prevent marine pollution. You can demand that businesses live up to their responsibility to curtail marine pollution. You can boycott companies that waste resources and use too much packaging. You can call on governments to enact policies that reduce the use of plastic. And you can change your own habits as a consumer, using less and recycling more. The protection of our seas and oceans is our human right. Chemical. There are more than 100,000 chemical compounds in use today. Many, like lead, are hazardous and cause serious illnesses like cancer. These chemical pollutants are not only responsible for an estimated 1.6 million deaths every year, they also damage the ozone layer and contribute to climate change. You can demand that governments enforce existing legislation and impose new laws limiting the use of poisons. A life free from toxic chemicals is our human right. Waste. Nearly 30% of the food we produce is wasted, squandering the precious resources that went into making it. Much of that food also ends up in landfills where it rots and produces methane, a key driver of climate change. How can we stop this? We can exercise our right to participate in public life, backing politicians that are serious about limiting waste. We can support local advocacy campaigns working towards solutions to the impacts of waste on the environment. A clean environment is our human right. Pollution affects almost every aspect of life on Earth. But when people exercise their environmental rights, we have a fighting chance to beat pollution and to ensure the health of our planet. Do your part. Claim your right to a safe and healthy life. It is our human right.
congratulations to the UNEP for this comprehensive film. And I think we all now have a good understanding of our right to a healthy environment. Toxic chemicals everywhere, right to a clean air, access to clean water, a clean environment is a human right. And now I am now delighted to have the honor to welcome Maria. She was the president of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly of the United Nations. And she's a counselor of the World Future Council. She's one of the architects of the UN processes, the future we want. Maria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey, for this general introduction. Thank you to Alexandra and Samia and to the World Future Council for bringing us together to discuss such a critical issue, which is uh, our health, uh, the very existence of, of the future of humanity. Uh, and I, I strongly believe that the approval by the General Assembly of uh, the resolution about the access to a clean, healthy, and sustainable uh, environment as, as a human right is, is a major step forward, both in international environmental law, but also in international human rights law. And sometimes, um, Jeffrey and, and friends, we see you know, a resolution that is approved by the General Assembly, but um, what is behind that is a huge, a huge political energy and, and effort. As we know, before um, the resolution came to the General Assembly, it was uh, first approved by the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And um, it took uh, several years uh, just to discuss and agree upon the fundamentals. But now we have a powerful tool. The challenge, of course, is how to put uh, this uh, new generation of, of, of rights into practice, uh, especially uh, when we live uh, in the Anthropocene. And uh, this era, uh, as we know, unfortunately, uh, of what we heard in the, in the film by, by UNEP, but in the data and information you shared, uh, Jeffrey and Alexandra, uh, that uh, the current economic models, uh, our production and consumption patterns uh, have uh, trespassed uh, planetary boundaries. We have gone above the limits of the carrying capacity of uh, ecosystems and the earth system uh, uh, to bear you know, the impacts of human activity. So your words, uh, Jeffrey, were very loud and clear. And how to uh, basically here the question is how to ensure we act uh, to avoid that environmental hazards uh, take away the lives as we heard of 1.7 million uh, children each year. Uh, how, how we can ensure that the massive displacement and migration caused by the climate crisis for that matter stops. So children and women, uh, are not forced to flee uh, because of environment-related disasters, in particular climate-related disasters. So um, just to, to share uh, some, uh, some numbers uh, here. So if our current emissions trajectory continues, there are estimates that we will have about 1 billion, 1 billion, meaning 100 billion displaced people due to the climate catastrophe we are experiencing. So uh, the, the, the general environmental outlook is, uh, is bleak and, and we know it. And there are hundreds of data and information out there. And many of these information and the data was provided in the, in the film we, we just saw. Uh, we also know that uh, the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine have unleashed um, a, um, a cost of living exponential increase due uh, to associated crises, the energy crisis, the food crisis, the financial crisis, especially for developing countries, for low and middle income countries. Uh, we saw at, uh, at uh, last year, the report on the sustainable development goals implementation. And, uh, and again, the landscape is disheartening. There is a, an evident backsliding in almost every sustainable development goal. 
uh, let's only think that um, uh, many of these uh, 93 million that have been pushed into extreme poverty last year, uh, among them, there is a high number of, of women and girls uh, and children uh, with uh, little opportunity uh, uh, to look at the future. So uh, if we look at the current, the existing uh, national commitments on climate under the umbrella of the Paris Agreement, the, the, the plan to peak emissions by 2025 and achieve net zero by 2050 is out of reach and we know it. We, we are instead uh, witnessing a growth uh, uh, of emissions with uh, the rise of 40, 14% uh, by, by 2030. So uh, what we hear um, time and again is that we do need a global social contract. We need to change the rules of the game. We need a rejuvenated, retooled multi multilateral system. And that includes, of course, uh, to, to fully include uh, this new generation of rights, uh, but not only in the paper, as we have done with the resolution of the General Assembly, we need to translate them into improving the lives and livelihoods of all women, especially, especially the younger generations, you know, that have to bear the brunt of, of uh, inaction, of inefficiency, and often even indifference. And uh, we also heard, you know, as, as a consumer, you have the power, you can uh, call on the law, the existing laws to ensure that our human right uh, to a clean, safe, and healthy environment is exercise. And, but we also know that uh, there are several structural hurdles that we need to address including the compliance mechanisms for existing multilateral environmental agreements. We know that there are thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of multilateral environmental agreements, but with very weak accountability and legal liability mechanisms. They stop at recommendations, at suggestions to member states. If, for example, the Rotterdam Convention, uh, uh, the Basel Convention, uh, I, I think that uh, what we need and we collectively need to work on is a, a stronger governance structure to, to ensure that we boost the liability mechanisms to better respond to this triple planetary crisis. Um, we, everybody's now talking about the triple planetary crisis, but it, it actually exists. It's out there. It has indicators that are scary um, such as the um, and the use of toxic of toxic chemicals we heard 100,000 chemicals that are there uh, harming our health our future especially of our children so uh, we need to double the strength of again liability mechanisms uh, the climate crisis, the extinction crisis, the pollution crisis, they all come together and they are symptoms of unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. So uh, we need a whole of society response to this, not only governments, but societies as a whole, the private sector, uh, the companies that have to exercise their uh, responsibility on human rights and on the rights of nature for that matter. So what can be done for a transformative action to implement the right to clean and, and healthy environment? And I would say to be very practical, there is a two-prone approach, uh, a layered set of actions that are not mutually exclusive. And having had a, an experience as a former ambassador to the UN, both in Geneva and New York, but also as president of the General Assembly. You know, sometimes you have to use, in terms of strategy, a two-speed approach. One is about incremental improvement and change. Uh, use the multilateral means we have uh, in hand. And I would like to share here very concrete ideas. Uh, number one, we should include the, the right to a clean and healthy environment in the reports of states to the Human Rights Council through the Universal Periodic Reviews. 
uh, we should have uh, specific indicators of uh, this new set of rights. Number two, uh, ensure that country reports uh, on the nine human rights treaty bodies, all the human rights related conventions, including the two covenants on social and economic rights and civil and political rights, include the right to a clean and healthy environment. So um, that's a, a mechanism that can really help to implement uh, this a new set of human rights, including the right to a safe and healthy environment. Number three, ensure that uh, countries' voluntary national reviews, the so-called VNRs on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, include a cross-cutting dimension of the state of ecosystems in the response to the three planetary crises that I mentioned climate extinction and pollution, and how they connect uh, with uh, goals such as poverty reduction, access to safe water and sanitation, food security, universal health coverage, etc. Number four, um, establish a clearinghouse, perhaps hosted by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, of good practices in terms of policy and legal frameworks regarding the implementation of the rights to a clean and safe environment. And as we know, a resolution by itself uh, has not the power it should have if there is no national legislation and a normative framework that is developed at the national, at the national level. And at the national level, um, enhance uh, the capacity of countries to establish legal liability mechanisms, including specialized judges, courts for the violation of the rights to a clean uh, and healthy environment. So in, 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 uh, in addition to that, we are very much looking forward to the general comment 26 from the Committee on the Rights of the Child this year. Uh, and. Um, I think this can also be an additional tool that uh, we can use. So um, in terms of strategy, it is so important to rally forces and voices, of course, including the voices uh, of children and youth. Uh, these voices need to be heard. And um, there are um, moments in the multilateral scene in the near future that we need to take into consideration. Number one, uh, ensure, for example, that the summit of the future, the pact of the future that is expected to be the outcome of the summit, include uh, a strong language and specific commitments from all member states to increase um, uh, the, the guarantees, uh, the legal provisions uh, to enforce the right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, an additional very important issue is that we ensure that the newly established youth office at the United Nations and the Declaration on the Rights of Future Generations fully include reference to the intergenerational rights to a clean and healthy environment, especially uh, for children. In, in here, there is a more ambitious agenda, perhaps, and I would like to end with, with that um, it requires a, a far-reaching process that includes a paradigm shift and unlocking the political divides within the UN, I have to say. Uh, and this is, um, I would say, the strong need to resume the negotiations of a global pact for the environment that will include uh, an earth systems approach. I think um, that umbrella um, new global pact uh, would enable uh, to really modernize um, and bring together all the very complex, scattered, siloed uh, multilateral environmental architecture, including the human rights uh, to uh, uh, a clean and healthy and sustainable environment. So I would leave it here, uh, open to questions and comments, and over to you, dear Jeffrey. Thank you. Medasi Bibri. And that means thank you very much in the Ghanaian language. And I said this because Maria has stepped foot on the Ghanaian soil in May 2019 when she paid a historic visit to Ghana, my country. Indeed, we need to change the rule of the game and include, include the rights of younger generations and also have specific indicators of this set of rights. These were her words. And again, she was the president of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly, executive director of GW Voices, and also a counselor of the World Future Council. 
Thank you so much for highlighting the importance of establishing and promoting the right to a healthy environment at a UN level. Thank you so much, Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Now to proceed, we definitely cannot ignore the impact of the climate change and also environmental degradation anymore. And the time is to act now. There is no other time but to act now. This is what children and young people all over the world are standing up, demanding the right to a healthy and clean environment and calling on governments to take critical actions on environmental crisis. It's been now 34 years since all states parties with one exception have ratified the UN Convention on the Rights to, of the Child. You know, a powerful tool that has initiated this paradigm shift and made children and young people the subjects of laws whose views and their right to participation in this decision that affect them are to be taken into account. And what am I talking about? I am talking about the UN Committee work on a general comment on number 26, the children's rights and environment with a special focus on climate change. We will have Reina Ivanova, who is together with me um, at a youth present representative of the World Future Council, but it's quite unfortunate. She can't join us live, but due to extenuating circumstances, but she kindly provided a video message for us. So let's kindly enjoy and let's know what her comments are on this general comment on number 26. Hello everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Anand Zamia for giving me the opportunity to give input for this World Thinkers webinar. My name is Reina and I am an 18-year-old climate justice and child rights activist from Germany and also a representative of Youth Present, the Youth Forum of the World Future Council. Before I start with my input today, I'd like to ask you a question that ideally you can think about throughout my input that I'd like to come back to at the end. And that question is, what does the Convention on the Rights of the Child mean to you? Hopefully more than just some pieces of paper with articles written on it. But I think that especially during times like these, where we are facing multiple crises at the same time, and the climate crisis is um, continuously getting worse, uh, many of us realize how difficult it is to really translate those articles that are written on paper in the Convention on the Rights of the Child into reality for children. In 2021, UNICEF published its first ever climate index report in which they categorized all the countries of the world in terms of how severely they're impacted by climate change. You see the scale in the bottom corner here. What they found is that almost half of the world's children, which is almost 1 billion children, live in countries that are extremely highly endangered by the climate crisis. When I hear statistics like that, I shiver. To me, this is not just another high number. Um, it is an unimaginably large amount of children who are suffering because of climate change. And even in countries like Germany, which is categorized as low to medium risk, the climate crisis is not a problem of the future anymore. In the same year that this index was published, Germany experienced a severe flood in the West, in a region called Atar. In this flood, over 130 people lost their lives, the youngest one being a four-year-old child. We clearly see that the climate crisis is a human rights crisis, but it is also a child rights crisis because when climate-induced catastrophes like this occur, children are always the biggest stakeholders and most impacted by it. So what can we do to make sure that child rights, which we celebrate through the convention, are actually translated into the reality for children? I think the answer to this question is actually um, more simple than you might expect. And it is by listening to young people, creating spaces where they can voice their opinions, and then most importantly, acting based upon what they say. A few years ago, um, when the Convention on the Rights of the Child 
celebrated its 30th anniversary, I took part in it in Geneva. Two essential things surprised me at this celebratory gathering. The first one being how very few young people were present. Besides me and the young activists that you see in this picture, there was only a handful of other young people who were there. The second one was that climate change was not on the agenda. This celebration took place well after the Paris Climate Agreement was settled, whilst the climate crisis was already imposing a huge threat onto child rights, and still climate change wasn't talked about by the adults. It was only through the input of us young activists that the intersection between the climate crisis and child rights was considered. And it had a positive impact. Shortly after our speaking at the celebration, two new working groups were formed on the environment and on child participation, which to this day work closely with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. But child rights have to be demanded in order to be realized. For this reason, I joined 15 other young people in filing the first ever complaint to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in September of 2019. Our complaint was directed towards five countries, including my own Germany, and we argued that through their contribution to climate change, they are violating our rights to life, health, cultural identity, and many more. Unfortunately, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child dismissed our complaint in October of 2021. However, we think that in some ways we're still successful with our complaint. For example, one of the reasons why the general comment that the UN Committee is now about to publish is on the right to healthy environment is precisely because of the complaint that we brought to them. However, what this also shows us is that in situations of crisis, change cannot happen too slowly. I think it's great that the new general comment will be written on the right to a healthy environment. However, I ask myself, how will this directly help the many hundreds of thousands of young children who are currently suffering because of the climate crisis? And when will this piece of paper actually translate into something that will cause a positive change in their reality? I think another good example of how well-intended legislation and the reality of young people collide is Litzrat, a small village that is only a one-hour drive away from the Ahtal, where the major flood occurred in 2021. You might have heard about Litzrat in the news recently, because this small village, which is located at the edge of Europe's second biggest open-cast coal mine, was now vacated by the police because the coal mine is supposed to be expanded amidst the climate crisis, which will make it impossible for Germany to stay below the 1.5 climate target set by the Paris Climate Agreement. What this means to me is that it doesn't end with the general comment, it only starts, because it presents us with a new opportunity to talk to lawmakers and legislators and cause a positive change for the children all around the world. What the Convention on the Rights of the Child means to me has strongly shifted since I started my journey in activism. And regardless of what it might mean to you, I think that we all have to come together and actively work towards realizing it and shifting it from paper into reality for young children for it to actually be effective. And this will only be possible if we shift the boundaries of what seems realistic and think outside the box, come up with new ideas, and in doing so, co-create these new solutions with diverse young people in order to protect our planet, protect each other, and create a world that not only sustains my generation, but also the generations of the future. Thank you for listening to me and I hope you have a pleasant rest of the webinar.
this is not a problem of the future anymore. This is the problem of the now and how do we translate these rights on paper into reality? And as I said, this is the time to act and you and I need to stand up for the environmental rights. Thank you so much, Reina, for sharing this insight with us. And now this is crucial. I will also encourage everybody to comment on the draft of this general comment. It's a great opportunity for us and we will put a link in the chat right away. Great, excellent. Now it's time for the awaited panel discussion on the nexus of peace, hazardous chemicals, and a ride to a healthy environment with a special focus on children. Now during this conversation, you are all much welcome to ask questions, make comments in the chat, and I will direct them to the speakers during the debate. I am very, very happy to have here with me again an inimitable and estimable set of amazing panelists. And when I mean amazing, I mean it. I'm very, to, I'm very much happy to have here with me Nishan Kunasekara, Councillor of the World Future Council. He's an international lawyer and an educationist. Bia Alberman, who is with me again, a youth present representative of the World Future Council, and she's a planetary health advocate. Alan Wa, counselor of the World Future Council, and also a founder and global coordinator of the Network Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, as well as Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Thank you so much. Now, let me first welcome Nishan. Kunasekara, great to have you here with us today. Nishan, you are working on the concept of intergenerational equity and trusteeship in legal and political systems. Why are these concepts so crucial with regards to implementing the rights of the future generations and the right to a healthy environment? Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, warm greetings to my distinguished panelists, as well as uh, Maria and Raina who spoke before me. Um, thank you for the kind invitation to the World Future Council, to Samia, Alexandra, and the team, uh, Anna. Uh, it's a pleasure to connect. Jeffrey, it's a weighted question and a timely one. Um, I'll do my best to uh, give some responses, although I think each response uh, merits a separate dialogue uh, in the days ahead, but it is a timely conversation on how intergenerational equity and trusteeship, which are cardinal principles of international environmental law, really needs to inform both legal and political systems of today. My responses are threefold. First, the urgency in which we need to find solutions and you heard Maria talking about a whole of society approach, not only a global level or local level or national level, but all of us involved as one moving towards achieving uh, what we call uh, protection and conservation of uh, the earth ecosystem. Uh, and that is not just human as one life form, but all species on our planet home and intergenerational equity and the principles of trusteeship are, are absolutely key in getting at them. Now, these two principles, uh, uh, briefly speaking, uh, you know, has had a, a very rich discourse within the legal jurisprudence. In modern terms, uh, it goes back to the 1980s uh, for the wonderful work of uh, a jury such as Professor Edith Brown Weiss, who attempted to define it uh, and I think Raina, who spoke just before me, uh, covered most of it in saying, what is the duty on the current generations make, when we make decisions that impact not only us, but those generations of life to come after us. And uh, the principle of trusteeship, uh, Jeffrey, as I understand, uh, is also uh, the how we should achieve uh, these uh, principles of intergenerational liquidity. How are we trustees? not just those who own anything, but hold in trust uh, the planetary resources and how can we pass it on to the future generations in a way that they can reach their full potential. Uh, and uh, interestingly, one of the founding counselors of the World Future Council, Judge Christopher Veeramantri, really 
through his erudite scholarship and jurisprudence at the International Court of Justice, really brought in were religions, cultures, indigenous systems, and the traditions that we have to infuse value to intergenerational equity and trusteeship. And one such example was his separate opinion in the Gabchikovo case, which was a decision in 1997, almost a quarter of a century ago before our meeting this morning, Jeffrey. So I think uh, the values of such judgments and such writings is going to be important as we inform a legal systems. And the second point I wanted to mention was the processes that I think uh, both Maria as well as Raina spoke about with regard to the movements, the human rights law movement, the environment movement in the modern uh, context, and most importantly, what Reiner and you and everybody represents, the voices of young people and the power of youth and how the children's rights are brought into uh, to the forte with regard to intergenerational equity and realizing our duties to each other. And uh, I congratulate the World Future Council to having you all and Samia specifically and the team for the youth present. I think it's a absolutely critical moment on how we achieve and uh, realize the right to a healthy environment, but through not only the prism of children's rights, but through the participation and effective advocacy of young people. I think that is a critical element of achieving intergenerational equity. And finally, uh, on, on how this should inform the uh, political realms of the time, uh, I don't want to repeat what Maria already said, but there's a huge urgency, specifically given the climate crisis on the one hand and the nuclear crisis where a nuclear bomb could be used at any given minute, given the, the, the violence which is prevalent in the current uh, day uh, with wars in Eastern Europe and other parts of the world is also upon us. So this dual crisis hangs as uh, the sword of Democles above us, it's double-edged. And to get above this, to ensure that the legal principles of intergenerational equity and inter principles of trusteeships informs uh, the wisdom of the political leaders of today, we need to take up an initiative, what we have already started a few years ago called a trusteeship. And I will return to this uh, uh, idea and initiative later on, Jeffrey, but those are the responses I wanted to leave with you as a, an initial round. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting on how legal trusteeship is significant and key to this implementation and also writes her rating on the whole society approach. Now to Ms. Bia Alberman, thank you so much for being here today and following on Nishan's remark, from your perspective, how do you, how important is this resolution to the right to a healthy environment from the perspective of young people as a youth present representative? Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for the question. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm a 25 year old medical doctor from Switzerland. And so I not only bring in the, the youth perspective, um, but also this health perspective. And I was also at COP27 in Egypt uh, a few months ago. And there, uh, youth movements, but also we as medical doctors, we really fought for having the right to healthy environment in the text of the last World Climate Conference because it disappeared, it came back in, and it is so crucial. And I, I love to tell you why. Um, for, for us um, in the hospitals, uh, the climate crisis is not just any crisis, um, but it's a health crisis already now because all around the planet, no matter where, um, also in Switzerland, people are dying of the climate crisis. And when we talk about people, um, I mean, elderly people, but especially also children um, in particular. Children and young people are particularly vulnerable um, to climate effects. For example, when we, we heard about the air pollution, um, for me, I don't know about you, but when I hear, hear like big numbers, like 7 million people die every year of air pollution, for me, it's very hard to imagine like, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? Um, and for just to give you an example, uh, every child knows that smoking is bad, right? Like cigarettes are not get good for your health. But actually, more people die every year due to air pollution than due to tobacco and smoking. So it's it's 
a huge effect all around the world. Um, and especially for asthma, for example, which gets really worse, worse in cities for children, um, which can lead to them dying of asthma just because the air is so bad. And also um, in areas around the world where we have a higher pollution, uh, we see a higher rate of women losing their children when they're pregnant. So not like even the unborn children are affected of air pollution. Um, so we this is just for the one thing then we also have the heat effects um which uh, like the ex with extreme weather events we have higher and higher temperatures and right now we are not at all on track to 1.5 we from the medical community we say 1.5 to stay alive because with the current uh rather track to 2.7 or 3 degrees of a global warming um, for example, in the Middle Eastern or and North African region, like a temperature rise of, of this amount would mean that 60% of the crop fields would decrease. This means that we have a huge amount of malnutrition, that we don't have enough food anymore, we have water scarcity. So these are things that we are already seeing now, and it's just getting worse. So taking this right to a healthy environment is so fundamental to acknowledging that. It's not just only about future generations, but that the health of children and young people today is under threat. And this is unacceptable. And I think this, um, this perspective that children are bringing in um, and also the, the change they're bringing upon is really a huge leverage point um, as a narrative for a change. Because what I'm saying you here is, is not news, right? We, we have been knowing that environmental destructions um, have effects on our health since decades. And it's not news that the climate crisis is happening and it's no news that we should really change something. <laughs> Everyone is saying it, right? Last week, there was the World Economic Forum in Davos. And um, like, if you just listen to the people, you really think, oh, yeah, I think they're taking care of our future. But then if when we're looking at what is happening in the hospitals, then we see, and also outside the hospitals, because some children don't even have access to healthcare, then we see um, what the real thing is and how decision-making power is distributed. And since it's not the children, and especially for when we look at children, the girls are especially, so there's also a gender component. When we take like the multiple discrimination aspects into account, we realize that those who are the most affected, they are not at all represented in the decision-making power, like it was present last week uh, in Davos with the world leading industries. So yeah, um, this is our call for, for SOS to really um, urgently Definitely. start to, to move towards a, a huge transformation. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. The climate crisis is a health crisis. The climate crisis is a health crisis. And I perfectly agree with you about you know, the nexus of climate and health, which is not really talked about on the conversation table. But most importantly, I'm super glad to see you as a health advocate within the climate space. Now, let me, let me get to Alan Y now. Big welcome. Thank you so much for your time. And I know you are very busy these days and you are working in a crucial space that can make or break global efforts. You are a peace activist and an advocate to abolish all nuclear weapons. And within the World Future Council, you are also part of the Commission on Peace and Disarmament. Peace is a crucial part when we talk about a right to a healthy environment. But then from your perspective, what can be done to elevate and implement the UN Human Rights Committee affirmation that nuclear weapons and the climate change threaten the right to life of current and future generations. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey, and please forgive the background noise. I'm calling from Geneva Airport because I've just been at the Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva, uh, lobbying on both the nuclear weapons and climate issues in the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, nuclear weapons primarily, but also a bit about climate change and the right to a healthy environment. Uh, 
the first, I think we have two interventions. The first one I'll do is on nuclear weapons and the right to life. And the second one, which will be very brief, action to achieve a nuclear weapons free world. So in this intervention, I'm looking at the legal obligations of the non-threat use of nuclear weapons, the obligations for nuclear weapons elimination, and I'll touch a bit on climate change also. Uh, so just two days ago, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists reset the hands of the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been throughout the history of humanity indicating the very severe dangers and risks to humanity and the planet from nuclear weapons and climate change in particular, but also other existential threats, uh, escalating wars, uh, threats to public health in the oceans, but the principal ones are nuclear weapons and climate change, which are posing the most severe threats. So how can we act on these in the UN human rights context? Uh, well, we have a, an opportunity since 2018 when the UN Human Rights Committee adopted General Comment 36 on the right to life. The right to life is Article 6 on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which every country in the world is a party to, with the slight exception of China, which is signed but not ratified, but it's still you apply this. So every country is under obligations to uphold you know, their uh, human rights uh, 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 obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, in, in particular, on nuclear weapons, paragraph 66 of General Comment 36 uh, affirmed that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is incompatible with the right to life and that there is an obligation to achieve a nuclear weapons free world. And paragraph 62 indicated that climate change threatens the right to life. So we can now follow up in particular in the process is called the Universal Periodic Review. What that is, is that's a review of government's implementation of their human rights obligations. So it's on a rotating boat, rotating basis. It's generally about 12 countries at a time. They're up there. You can see here the picture on the right there is the Human Rights Council. And then in the Human Rights Council, they have to present reports about how they're implementing their human rights uh, obligations. And that's not just under the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it's other human rights treaties, the UN Charter and other international law. So it's quite broad and both other countries and civil society can ask questions, can challenge the, what the governments are doing and make recommendations. Um, and I just mentioned there that with regards to nuclear weapons, the additional law which we've been bringing into the Human Rights Council um, is the International Court of Justice uh, affirmation in 1996 on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, which um, is uh, based on international humanitarian law and the UN Charter. So what we have been doing with our partner organisations since 2018 is making submissions uh, as various countries have come up for review. Our primary focus will be on nuclear weapons. I mentioned we also touch on climate change. So we've been doing it with regards to the nuclear weapon states, those that have produced nuclear weapons, and their allies that are under extended nuclear deterrence relationships. So these are the ones that we've done so far, and we're going to keep continue to do it on a rolling basis. Um, so then what, what do we say in them? Well, we basically say that their policies to threaten or use nuclear weapons, to produce nuclear weapons, and to fail to negotiate for complete nuclear disarmament is in violation of their obligations under human rights and other international law. And they need to reverse this. So the first thing is immediate measures to do. Affirm that nuclear weapons should never be used uh, and adopt policies to make that happen. No first use policies are called. And then get rid of nuclear deterrence. We understand that countries are relying on nuclear deterrence for their security, some, they have to replace that. And we say replace it with common security, use conflict resolution, use international law, use the International Court of Justice, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the Mediation Service of the UN. There are many ways of achieving your security and resolving conflicts without the illegal reliance on nuclear deterrence. Uh, and then also give a time-bound commitment to eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, all of the countries say, except they have an obligation, but they never say when they'll do it. And it just keeps going on and on forever. So we say, give a time-bound commitment, and it should be no later than 2045, the 100th anniversary of the UN. That gives them plenty of time to, to get rid of nuclear deterrence, to build up their common security. 
And then on the climate issue, I'm sorry, I'm only just touching it briefly because we don't have much time, but the climate one is really important. And we don't yet have at the international level on climate what we have with nuclear weapons. A decision from the International Court of Justice, the world supreme judicial organ, on what are the obligations to protect the climate and to ensure the human rights of current and future generations um, are preserved with regards to the climate issue. So the World's Youth for Climate Justice has initiated uh, this campaign to take the issue of climate change, the International Court of Justice, the building on the success we had when we took nuclear weapons to the International Court of Justice. They've got 18 countries now have agreed to this and have lodged a resolution in the UN General Assembly. So we expect it will be adopted sometime within the next one or two months, and then we'll have the case and we can participate in that case and really strengthen the legal obligations to fast track the shift away from fossil fuels and to protect the climate. Um, and we do a number of events. So for example, yesterday, we just did an event here where we had a mixture of government delegations, UN officials, experts and activists, you know, uh, in, informal Chatham House rules, discussions on how that we can move this forward. Uh, so thank you very much. This is the human rights one. And then I'll come back a little bit later and talk about another action that we in civil society can take to push the agenda for a nuclear weapons free world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was super, super comprehensive. And thank you for sharing that from the peace perspective or standpoint. Now, we've had viewpoint from the legal trusteeship, health, planetary, and climate, and also from the peace perspective. Now we will get to the, what is actually going on at the UN level. And um, I will pose this question to Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Now, at the, at the UN, you are currently working on the summit of the future and also the pact of the future. I'll be glad if you can provide a brief introduction to these two initiatives and explain to us how are they linked to the right to a healthy environment and most significantly, the role of young people. Well, thank you, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I think that uh, this idea of, of rethinking and retooling the UN system it has been around for decades because we have uh, uh, to uh, remind ourselves that this organization uh, was created um, uh, 70, practically 78 years ago uh, in a very particular uh, geopolitical context after the Second World War. And if we only think that only 51 member states signed the San Francisco Charter, the UN Charter. Uh, it was a very particular moment in history. And it is about time that uh, we rethink, you know, the 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 organization, the world organization we have created. Uh, because the reality uh, is a completely different reality right now, not only that we have 193 member states, but it's not only about the number of countries, it is about the complexity of the world, the new issues, um, the uh, triple environmental crisis, uh, you know, what has happened with the decolonization processes, uh, what has happened uh, with the, the new generation of human rights after uh, the adoption of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, in, in 48. So the world is different. Society is different. The power, for example, of transnational corporations is different. Uh, the configuration of nation states, uh, and, you know, so we need a, a profound shift. And, and there are many approaches uh, there. There is uh, groups of people really thinking about rewriting the charter or reforming the, the UN charter. Uh, and of course, to open uh, the chart, uh, the charter to reform, uh, you need uh, the support of the P5 members, of the permanent five members of the Security Council. So it's not an easy task. But at the same time, what happened in um, in the, during the 75th anniversary of the UN, uh, I was uh, strongly pushing uh, for the idea. You cut me, uh, Jeffrey, when my time is 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 over. But uh, just to say where where it started, the idea of the summit of the future, a potential pact for the future, started with the idea of opening the discussion on the future of the UN using the 75th anniversary. And and I was. 
uh, very uh, strong on the idea of having uh, a mandate from the General Assembly, which we did uh, to negotiate the modalities resolution for the UN 75 process took us eight months. Uh, it wasn't an easy issue, even if, uh, if it doesn't sound very complicated, but things are difficult at the UN and you know very well. Um, uh, we uh, uh, pushed for that. There was a global conversation about the future of the UN uh, during the 75th anniversary uh, that uh, gave birth to the UN uh, 75 political declaration, which I think it's a very strong document of 12 action points. That declaration requested the Secretary General to produce a report uh, for last year, that was our common agenda, which in my opinion, even with the flaws, even if it's not a perfect document, but it's a blueprint, it's a roadmap for a reform process to revitalize uh, the UN apparatus. And, and uh, the, the Our Common Agenda uh, suggested a series of summits uh the the well summit of of sdgs this year a ministerial meeting uh preparing for the summit of the future this year but a summit of the future in 2024 and the big expected outcome uh, there is uh, a new pact for the future which is a big opportunity because at the same time the our common agenda you know, establish a new youth office at the UN, uh, which is an upgrade of the special envoys office, but with, with a greater latitude and, and budget finally, no, and also a um, declaration for uh, the rights of, of future generations, it, it, no, that is in the making uh, right now. And I think that the voice uh, of, uh, of young change makers, the voice of children needs to be, be heard, not only for the declaration that is in the making, but throughout the process that is going to, to take us to the summit of the future. I think that we cannot craft a pact for the future without the active engagement of young change makers, of children uh, themselves. They have, they need to have a voice. And, um, the idea is that uh, the UN cannot be anymore like a three pillar organization dealing with peace and security, with human rights and development. We need to add a fourth leg uh, to this structure and the fourth leg uh, has to be environmental integrity and earth systems integrity because it connects all of the three uh, together. So uh, there is a lot of creativity, a lot of um, movement, intelligence, activism, uh, intellectual food uh, into the process. And I think that uh, we cannot be indifferent. So I call on you, on, on young leaders to, to be present, to be part, to engage uh, in this reinvention process of, of the UN. And I'm an optimist. I know that the global overall scenario is bleak. We have heard, you know, scary numbers. We hear and read scary numbers, scary situations all over the world. Bea uh, mentioned, you know, from, from her health perspective, what is happening, but we cannot be indifferent. It is the time now. I feel that there is momentum for a profound transformation in our multilateral architecture. And, and I am not uh, among the ones saying, it's your turn you have it and, and bring all the responsibility on younger generations and say, you fix uh, what we damaged. Uh, so it's not about that. It, it is about a true intergenerational engagement. It is a true sharing of voices in a horiz horizontal and respectful uh, way, because we do, you know, older generations, we also do have a big responsibility in all this, but now it's the time, it's now or never. Thank you, and back to you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. It's now or never, and definitely it's a true intergenerational engagement. Back to you, Nishan. I think this fits very, very well with what you said earlier. I mean, looking beyond these initiatives, how does the campaign take, how does the campaign, you know, to take climate change to the International Court of Justice help to strengthen legal obligations and resolutions to protect, protect future generations? Thank you, Jeffrey. Indeed, I think I'm um, taking a leave from uh, where Maria really left off, saying it is a intergenerational effort, which is uh, you know started, and I think uh, it's exciting uh, that there are these initiatives uh, that are coming through, 
uh, both legal but also social engagements from uh, different populations uh, from across the world. And the, uh, the advisory opinion campaign, I understand uh, fellow panelist Alan, he's more intimately involved as well. So, you know, I'll bring him in later on. But just to say, it, it, first and foremost, last December was a quite an uh, interesting passage of time. So on the 9th of December, we had Vanuatu who built on the power of youth and young people from the Pacific Islands uh, to push the conversation on having a resolution, asking the question from the UN member states, what are the responsibilities on member states under international law on protection of the climate system and other environmental uh, systems? Uh, now, I must say that while the question itself which is still being debated. And I believe the final resolution will be available uh, for uh, public scrutiny somewhere in the middle of February, and then uh, push to the General Assembly for a vote, uh, which I would invite everybody to participate. The, the processes in a campaign is, are equally important. And uh, you know, another quarter of a century ago, you know, Alan referred to this, that there was the illegality of nuclear weapons advisory opinion, uh, which was a question uh, to the International Court of Justice, uh, which perhaps uh, before uh, this question is the most important uh, uh, legal question ever to be put on to the International Court, uh, has several processes, the young people's voices, the evolution on, and the movements, whether it's human rights law or public international law and the environmental law, and the, the responsibilities that states equally as trustees take on uh, with regard to obligations. Uh, now, uh, one final point is that, again, inspired by uh, you know, a, a cross-generational conversation, but really young people, there is a number of uh, climate litigations and Raina mentioned initial ones in Germany, but you know, in Europe with the European Court of Human Rights, there have been a number of uh, such uh, questions been put. But uh, one specific one uh, that I would like to bring to everyone's attention is a uh, specific advice and opinion requested from the International Law of the Sea Tribunal, uh, which looks at uh, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So this raises various social and legal questions like what are the responsibilities of nation states beyond their borders? Can we continue to be subjecting ourselves to what we understand national jurisdictions and forget that we live on one planet? And these are real questions and real time we need solutions and answers for, which are not easy, but it is required of our times and of our generation. And for example, the ITLO's uh, advisory opinion, you know, as you know, Jeffrey, more than 70% of the earth is covered by the oceans. And can the law only actually have the force to bring about an understanding of how this is shared? Perhaps, but it also requires a much gigantic effort from all of us. And that's what campaigns such as ICJAO on climate change allows, uh, whilst the the conversation, what happens at the court, I leave it uh, to Alan to share with you, but those are my initial thoughts. And finally, one of the tools that I mentioned earlier is that we as trustees also need to necessarily educate ourselves. And I think that's one of the strongest uh, tools we have. So we started a process on education for trusteeship and, and that's the initiative that is ongoing. And I'm happy to share further information with uh, all those who are interested afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for also highlighting this initiative that is going on, which is the education for trusteeship. And also speaking about the ocean, definitely the ocean is one of the largest carbon sink we have. And if care is not taken, this can also turn into a carbon source. Now, back to you, Ms. Aberman, for, for, for us in the Youth Forum Youth Presents, it is very, very increasingly significant that you know, the work that Maria and Sean and Alan have just outlined we young people do not only find a voice, but we are heard and taken seriously. How can we, how can we ensure youth voices are integrated into all the UN processes and forums? And what are your demands to political decision makers? 
to answer your question, Jeffrey, um, I will not use my own words, but I had a look at the report of the general comment um, and they consulted young people because I'm 25, but when we talk about children, like those are people under 18. And there were two sentences that struck me in that report. Please demand our freedom, freedom of life and health. We can't enjoy life like you adults used to do when you were little. And I would like to tell the adults that we are the future generations. And if you destroy the planet, where will we live? And I would like to add up on the question, where will we live also? What air will we breathe? And what water would, will we drink? And will, which food will we eat? And I think when it comes to the concept of, yeah, we we are listening to youth voices. Sometimes um, we have this very tokenistic thing of, yeah, let's create an advisory board and let's have one young person. And then already we have questions of, okay, who are these young people? Are they representative of youth in general? Usually um, also at COP, we had a lot of uh, discussions about it. A lot, many times it's, you must be quite privileged to get even in the position to have access to these kind of boards. You need to have a certain kind of education and also financial status to get access to fly around the world or to travel, to have the equipment to join these kind of things. So when we talk youth participation and children participation, we must think about the barriers and be willing to invest the time and also the financial resources to really include them, not only for them to have a seat at the table, but also to question the shape of the table, right? Who designed this table? Are the climate negotiations as they're happening at COP27 or as they did at COP15, the Conference on Biodiversity, are these spaces where children can really have a voice? Are like, is a negotiation space as it is currently, does nature have a voice? Um, and those are open questions uh, that I send also <laughs> to my to my fellow panelists. Um, one other thought that I'm having um, and something that I'm hearing a lot is that um, older generations tell me, oh, but people like you and like you young activists, you make me hopeful. And I'm so hopeful that now is the time that also you young people will change the things. And there comes my... Um, medical voice in me saying, okay, when we look at the data, it's, we cannot wait, wait for the younger generations to, to be in the decision-making power because it's the next seven years until 2030 that will fundamentally decide, decide over our future. And like in the emergency room, we need to prioritize. And the thing that we pr need to prioritize now is abandoning our addiction for fossil fuels, which is why there is a global call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to really phase out of all fossil fuels. This is something we didn't manage um, in Egypt at the climate conference to have really a phase out of all fossil fuels, so coal, oil and gas um, in the agreement. And this is something we, we desperately need um, in order to realize this human right to a healthy environment. Um, and when we talk about the, those carbon emissions um, of the fossil fuels, this is just the first aid treatment. If we talk about the longer treatment, I think there we need, really need to think that it's not just the climate when we talk about environment, but it's like the planetary boundaries. So we need to think how can we have a system within those planetary boundaries that is healthy for current generations, but also for the future generations. And when we think about that, this also includes economy because we're talking environment and health. We also need to think about our economic system. Can it just grow, grow and grow? Or how do, can we design a system that respects those boundaries for the years and decades to come? Um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, as, yeah, um, discuss those questions further. I think the time is running up, but I will share the link for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty also in the chat if you have questions on that. And um, my last sentence that I, um, I think my main message that is um, and main demand is um, healthy people can only live on a healthy planet. And it is now the time to act. Um, yeah, and that we cannot just hope, but that we f take this beautiful future that we would like to have to the present and make it reality today. Thank you. Thank you so much.
that is that 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 is a great observation and introspection, and indeed also highlighting on the interrelationship between the economy and the environment. Now, perhaps one last question to Alan, which I find particularly relevant in the light of current world events. Alan, how can we achieve the global elimination of nuclear weapons, which might threaten the implementation of the right to a healthy environment and all other rights of current and future generations? Uh, thank you very much. I'm just trying to show the slide, but the chat bar is blocking the start of the slide. So unfortunately, you see it on small screen. Um, but firstly, uh, just to follow up on what Nisham was saying about the climate issue and the International Court of Justice case, I did put in the chat box a link to the draft resolution that Vanuatu and 17 other countries have been circulating to other UN members. Uh, this is a draft UN resolution to take the issue of climate change to the International Court of Justice, because it has to be asked by a, an, an authoritative UN body, and the General Assembly is the best one to do that. So that's in the chat box. Uh, also in the chat box, um, I'm still seeing if I can get rid of the, the chat box. It's blocking my PowerPoint, and I can't. Um, also in the in the chat chat box is the uh, link to the World Youth for Climate Justice, uh, which is the youth uh, the youth network which is leading this campaign to take the issue of climate change to the International Court of Justice. Now switching to nuclear weapons, I'm going to be brief because we're running out of time. We World Future Council is partnering with many organizations on a number of initiatives, but a key tool that we're using is this appeal. Uh, protect people and the planet, appeal for a nuclear weapons free world, because it brings the issues together. First, preventing nuclear war, uh, by affirming non-use of nuclear weapons, uh, the illegality of nuclear weapons use and policies, committing to the elimination of nuclear weapons, I already mentioned this before, by 2045, no later than that, the 100th anniversary of the UN, and ensuring that it gets into the Sustainable Development Goals the next round, and cutting nuclear weapons budgets globally, $100 billion a year is spent on the nuclear arms race. Uh, and this is not just the money that's spent within the nuclear armed countries, but banks, private investors, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, university funds around the world are investing in nuclear weapons corporations. So we call on everyone, stop investing in the nuclear weapons industry. It's not difficult to do it. There's only 27 corporations around the world that are actually a, a very deeply involved in nuclear weapons manufacture. It's very easy to cut them out of your investment portfolio, whether it's your, your own investments, if you have any money, um, I don't, but others do, or if you've got a university fund or um, or this uh, pension fund, it's easy to get rid of the nuclear weapons industry and put this into uh, the budgets and investments into protecting public health peace uh, and the climate. This appeal was launched at the UN at an intergenerational event with Sabir Shaldry, who's a World Future Council member. He was uh, participating in this call a bit earlier um, and is also the honorary president of the Interparliamentary Union. That's 178 parliaments around the world are engaged in this. Um, and Youth Fusion, uh, which is a youth network uh, uh, working on nuclear disarmament. And I'll put Unfold Zero, if you can see on the screen, is where you can sign the appeal. And Youth Fusion is a youth network which is promoting this. And you can also join Youth Fusion and engage in intergenerational action with young people working on these issues of nuclear disarmament, abolition, and making the connection with human rights and climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nishan, Marie-Claire, Alan, and Maria for your insightful submissions. And definitely we need a true intergenerational engagement. We need a profound shift. We need a whole society approach. And this is not a problem of, for the future anymore. It is a problem of the now. Now we have one question and this is particularly directed to Maria. Now the, the question says, what can we do as young people if governments don't react and ignore our rights to a healthy environment. I'll be glad if you can share your, any insights about this question, a brief one for us. Thank you. 
Well, I, I think that uh, the voices of young people are being heard. We are living a different world. And uh, sometimes I fear that the participation and the voice uh, of young people, I, it, you know, it's become like a token. And, uh, and we have to be careful about that. Uh, I think, I, I strongly believe that uh, young people should exercise their power and should have a loud voice uh, in an equal, on an equal footing. Uh, and uh, I think a great opportunity, I saw that Alan share uh, the link uh, with a great opportunity in March, uh, the, the Global Futures Forum that the coalition for the UN we need is is organizing in in New York and the world because it's also going to be virtual. I think we have to use all the spaces uh, we have to have our voices heard. Uh, we cannot sit on the side. We cannot just do consultations and say, "Oh yes, there were two young people that were here." Uh, you know, be very awake with the radar on all the time to make sure that your voices are heard. And, and believe me, uh, most governments understand now that they cannot take decisions uh, without seriously listening to the voices of younger generations uh, because, uh, because they care more than we did in the past, because they know, uh, they are knowledgeable, they have the information, uh, they have the power as, as well. And I think that we, you should exercise the power you have, uh, but uh, in a democratic way, in a real way, uh, engaging in the real way. You know, it's about power sharing. Uh, um, and uh, I say the same for women, because we have to also fight for our spaces. Uh, it's It's we have, this is again, a whole of society responsibility. And especially young people, they have a tremendous power uh, in voting for the right leaders uh, around the world. And they have to exercise their uh, voting powers as, as citizens. Global citizenship, citizenship from young people is extremely important. Um, you are here, you're loud, your voices are intelligent, knowledgeable, and all of that. But I think we should bring in, you know, more, more young people to the fore, uh, because uh, at least in part in parts like my, my own country in Ecuador, sometimes we see uh, young people disheartened and uh, they have lost hope uh, and they are playing, you know, the game of, of indifference. And, and, and uh, that cannot happen, especially for the countries that are suffering the most, especially for countries in the global south. So I'm very, very happy, Jeffrey, that you were here, you were guiding this conversation, and we have heard so many incredible voices, uh, Bea, as well. So very, very happy. Thank you so much. Young people out there, please do not lose hope. This is the time for us to really stand up for this environmental right. Now, unfortunately, we do not have much time. And I will be happy if, if there are more questions, we will be happy to receive such questions. Our email will be provided in the chat box. So kindly send your questions and we will make sure to answer them right after the webinar. Thank you so much, Nisha and Marie. Bia Alberman, Alan, and Maria, I would, like to, I would like to thank all our esteemed panelists for their insightful thoughts and um, our participants for your comments and your questions. Let me pass. Um, to conclude, let, let me know. Uh, let me now ask each panelist to share his or her concluding recommendations on how to implement the UN resolution. And you have 60 seconds. Maria, I would like you to begin. Me? Yeah. 60 seconds. <laughs> can I can I go, can I go say well 60 seconds to say that um you know I provided a series of not very ambitious but actionable and doable um, um possibilities uh, to make sure that uh the right uh to to a healthy environment um is exercised. And, uh, and it's very much on the way, you know, governments organize themselves, they comply with the human rights, very complex architecture out there. But uh, my, my call is uh, 
is uh, to support the ongoing efforts, uh, the, the Vanuatu um, um, initiative to support uh, the new treaty for the non-proliferation, not only of, of nuclear weapons, we, we have that and we often forget that we do have a convention for the total elimination of nuclear weapons as well that needs to be ratified by more, but the non-proliferation of fossil fuels uh, engage in the Global Futures Forum, uh, I think through um, youth uh, present, uh, we we can share, you know, what the architecture of the Global Futures Forum is 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 about, and and uh, I think it is about shared responsibility, active engagement, and a sense of possibility uh, and optimism, uh, realistic optimism, but optimism. Um, uh, so I, I think that's what uh, we are we are about, and we we count on younger generations, on young voices, on voices of children. Believe me, I've worked with children in the past. Uh, they have a lot also to to contribute, not only as victims but as actors and and change makers as well. So this is an intergenerational collective effort uh, to make the multilateral system uh, really deliver and and transform. Over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Allen, you have 60 seconds. Your last thoughts. Um, I, for, for the last 60 seconds, I think I, I say that we should be courageous together um, across generations, that we must realize the urgency of the situation. But even if time is running out and delay means death, this is not the time for plaster solutions. This is or band-aid solutions. We cannot just like put band-aids on the things, but we must acknowledge that this is a systemic problem. That we are living multiple planetary crises. That just aiming for a net zero won't solve solutions. So that we need those systemic approaches across sectors, across countries, across genders, but also across generations. And that we must now really try to create those spaces where everyone can really um, come together in a way um, that they find the solutions really going to the root causes and that we, we take the time to go to the root causes and address those issues to really change the systems and create systems that enable a healthy environment for healthy people for the future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nishan, 60 seconds. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think achieving intergenerational equity is an imperative of our generation. And for me, our generation is all of us. And how to do is, is we becoming trustees. And the tool that I would like to imperate is that we have a learning journey, like we're doing this uh, and this webinar, so that we are informed on how to bring about the changes that we require so that the next generation and future generations can realize not only a healthy environment, but a healthy planet so that they can realize their full potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Jeffrey. So the bulletin of atomic scientists two days ago said we're 90 seconds to midnight. So I loved your challenge that we can save the planet in 60 seconds. Um, that optimism, Let's do it. And it's important to make it easy for people to be engaged. You know, um, so join the Global Futures Forum, uh, endorse the appeal, protect people on the planet, share stories of hope um, on social media, you know, share actions together. Don't be despondent. Affirm that peace, peace and planetary protection is possible. Most of the time in most of the world, people are living in peace and respect for each other. Uh, the violence and destruction of the world is a minority, but it's a destructive minority. Uh, we can reaffirm the majority feeling, the majority of the world wants peace, planetary protection. We can make it happen and we can do it in 60 seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well said. Now, we are all now much better aware of the significant role of the UN initiatives, like the resolution to the right to a healthy environment and the general comments on amateurs in order to protect the rights of current and future generations. We are the World Future Council share this vision, by the way, and we have been record, recognized as 60 laws hailing from 40 different countries around the globe with a future policy award. We also invite you to our website, 
www.futurepolicy.org to learn more, more about these award-winning policy that drive positive change, address multiple crises we face, and also bring about results that are worth of replication globally. So join us in spreading the word about them, engage with us for a better future. I would like to end the session with a huge gratitude for our inimitable and estimable speakers for accepting to share their time and knowledge with us. We are extremely grateful. And to you all cherished participants and listeners who are joining us from Zoom, here on Zoom and also on Facebook, we thank you for your time, for listening and participating. We hope you will be our ambassadors for the right to a healthy environment in your various communities. Help us to push for this agenda because this defines how our common future will look like. I would also like to thank the entire team who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar success, especially Alexandra Wando, Samia Kasid, Anna, Lara, and also Helena Baus, and also all you present representatives. Thank you for your efforts and your dedication. Do not forget to follow the World Future Council social media handles on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also Instagram. And do not forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you are not missing out on our future webinars and also other activities. Thank you all once again for joining. See you next time. Enjoy your day. Goodbye.